welcome back to this new creepy news video. Today I wanted to share with you the unsolved case of Judy Ward that occurred in 1988. Now on the wiki they had the following to say about it. Julie Ward was a British woman who was killed in Kenya in September 1988. She died while on a safari in the Maasai Mara Game Reserve. The subsequent investigation into her death was notable for the campaign by her father, John Ward. Firstly, to persuade the Kenyan authorities to recognize that his daughter was murdered, and secondly, to try to identify the killer or killers. Three people were charged with her murder, although none have been convicted. So this is a pretty bizarre case. There's a lot of information you can find on it based on journal records, I guess, by John Ward himself. But today we're going to go over the basic details of what actually occurred and how they found this woman decades ago and are still trying to solve who is responsible for her death. So let's get right into it. On the 13th of September 1988, Julie's leg and part of her jaw were found by her father. At first the theory was that she must have been killed by local wildlife, but this quickly fell apart when we take into account her remains were also burned. The tragedy of the whole case seems to lie with the fact the government wasn't very keen on helping at the time. John Ward, Julie's father, went as far as to claim it was due to tourism they didn't want to classify this as a homicide case since it might have a negative impact on people wanting to come over. What struck me as odd was that they first seemed to claim Julie died because she was eaten by lions and then struck by lightning. Due to her own father's efforts, they were forced to admit that it was in fact a murder case. Now let's get back into the past before this whole tragic event took place. Julie had been in Africa for approximately 7 months photographing the local wildlife and she was about to return home. At the time she was traveling with a friend named Glenn Burns. It was around the 5th of September that car broke down and Glenn decided to call it a day and went back to a nearby town. Julie however stayed at a different lodge on her own. While staying there she had the car repaired and the next day on September 6th she traveled back to a campsite she had stayed at prior. The goal was to collect some personal belongings and go back to civilization. Sadly this would be the last time she was ever seen alive. What exactly happened at the campsite? How did she end up in a remote place dismembered and burnt? That is only something the real perpetrator knows, and decades later her father is still searching for answers. It is a shocking example of what family members actually go through when faced with horrifying life events such as these. It didn't take very long for her to be reported as a missing person and her father flew over to Kenya to go and search for her. He hired a plane in order to scout out the areas she was known to visit, and it was the pilot who ended up spotting her vehicle next to a river several miles into the harsh bush. Mr. John had reported the events as followed. On arrival at the scene I found an empty vehicle. I assumed that Julia had somehow got stuck in the mud of the gully I was now attempting to walk to safety. Why and how the vehicle had arrived at the remote location remained baffling, but that could wait. The priority was to find her. The gully where Julie Suzuki was found is a tributary of the river on the north side of the Sand River. The river flows through the game park contained within steep sided banks. There is no vehicle crossing at this point. Even on foot, the river would normally be impassable. On this day, September 13th, the water level was low and it would have been just possible to slide and scramble down the steep bank, wade across the river and scramble up the opposite side. Why on earth would anyone think Julie had done that? Her vehicle had left clear tire marks in the long grass on the north side. Logically, if she had got the vehicle stuck in the gully, she would have followed these tracks across country back to the road between Kikokorok and Sand River Gate, from where she had allegedly started her journey. However, logic has no place in the events surrounding Julie's disappearance. She was returning to Nairobi to fly home, after a brief visit to the Maasai Mara. The allegation that she had decided to turn off the main road, drive across the trackless rock-strewn bush before attempting to drive through a deep gully is as ridiculous as it is illogical. It became obvious that someone else had driven her vehicle across the bush into the gully. It is important to note that John spent over $1 million in order to uncover the truth of what had happened to Julie, and so far they had had three suspects but none were ever charged with her murder. In other words, among all the efforts to get justice for his daughter, we are so far left with a ton of wild theories. 
Some make more sense than others. The worst one of all is that she might have committed suicide, but again it wouldn't account for her body also being burned. What about the coroner's report? When they did find her body? Well, in Kenya they allegedly altered the documents on her case, leaving out crucial details making it seem like she was eaten by animals. But when a British pathologist got involved, he revealed she had been dismembered by a machete and afterwards doused in petrol before she was set on fire. It's clear someone tried to get rid of any evidence but failed to do so and therefore we can't dismiss the possibility of rape prior to her death, which happens quite a lot in Africa. In fact, one news article reported the following about this possible scenario prior to her own death. A former intelligence officer said in an anonymous interview with a Kenyan newspaper that three men on the reserve brutally gang raped and murdered Ward. He claimed she was ordered to drive her jeep several miles away from the Sand River camp, where it was strategically placed in a gully. She was then forced to draw an SOS mark in the sand to make it look as though she had gotten into an accident and was desperate for help. The official said that he had been too afraid to intervene at the time and was still too afraid to come forward. The things that I saw will live with me till I die, said the officer. As John kept investigating the case, things got even more bizarre. As he was waiting outside one of the lodges in the area, a woman came up to him and handed him a note which said, The man who killed your daughter is Jonathan Moe. John said the following about the event. After receiving the note, I contacted the lady and asked how she was able to make the allegation against Jonathan. She explained that she was a second-hand clothes dealer. The lady regularly visited the Maasai Mara and surrounding villages, selling their clothes. She said local women who were her customers included the wives of park rangers. She said she had heard the allegations about Jonathan Moe everywhere in the park, but particularly in the villages near Sekanani Gate and Olimotik Gate. The latter gate and adjacent villages are near the location Julie's dismembered remains were found. The world famous Coders Tourist Camp, then owned by the equally famous Glen Cotter, is also in the same area. I retained the folded note and passed it with the information to Scotland Yard, John said. After some further investigation into the stip and visiting Jonathan's farm, he found out that he had not lived there in over two years. You see, this case is full of specific individuals who may have been responsible or may be innocent in the end, since nobody was ever charged. In the description box I provided a link to a Facebook post that goes over John's search for answers. It is very in-depth, but it didn't seem complete. It seems to stop somewhere randomly, but there's a lot for you to read if you would like to see it for yourself. One thing we can all agree on is that Julie deserves justice, so hopefully one day the truth will be revealed. In the meantime, like always on Creepy News, we hope the victim is resting in peace. And with that being said, if you are new to this channel, consider subscribing to receive new videos about unsolved cases and other creepy things on a regular basis. As always, dear viewer, have sweet dreams.